no, the other one. Oh, the other son. I like the colors in the gold. Get ready for autumn. Well, it's kind of getting in. Especially this morning. Yeah, 49. <laughs>
Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning on Communion Sunday. Nice, cool morning. <laughs> Indication of maybe what's to come, although fall is a great time for me anyways. I really enjoy it. So again, thank you for being with us this morning.
But it wasn't always a desert because it originally had topsoil over it. But the farmer who had that property and farmed it did not do a good job of stewardship. And the topsoil got worn out and blew away and revealed just this silt, sand. It's a desert right here in, in Maine. Surrounded by nice forests and everything else, but about 40 acres or so of just desert. A few years ago, I was uh, able to go out to uh, the, the, de the southwest. And in, in, during school vacation week in April, and Diane and I went, we went to the Grand Canyon and other places, driving around in the deserts of Arizona. And we happened to coincide with what they were calling a super bloom in the oh. desert. Uh, in the springtime, there's flowers that show up in the desert every year. But this was, every once in a while, they get what they call a super bloom, and the desert was just absolutely covered mm -hmm. with beautiful flowers. The picture on the uh, bulletin is just black and white. It doesn't do it justice. But, but there's a, a picture you pass that around, too. The desert in bloom. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we are. <laughs> Have you, have you guys ever been to the desert of Maine? No? Tell your mom she should bring it here sometime. It's only in the next town of Freeport. And it's a, it's a real desert, about 40 acres or so, just pure sand dunes. And it's a tourist attraction. I think there's an admission fee to get in. But uh, an interesting story of how right here in Maine we have a desert. And that's the first picture there of the, the desert of Maine. The second picture is one of a real desert in the Arizona, and it's a time of year when the flowers were all in bloom, and I got to see that a few years ago. We got called to worship this morning by Isaiah, who tells us that the desert will bloom, that God makes things bloom. And so it's a reminder of God's, when we see that kind of thing, it's a reminder of God's love and care for us. We often think of a desert as being lifeless, but even when it's not in bloom, there's all kinds of life in the desert. And God takes care of all that life, and just once in a while, he brings in a pop of great, great beauty. And that's something we can all enjoy. So, thank you. I'm glad you could here. <laughs> Mike. Uh, I, was, I was talking with uh, 
I, I was talking with Mike and uh, emailed with uh, Ann. Andrew is, uh, has been moved over to Barbara Bush. Uh, he's feeling good about it. He's flirting with the nurses. Uh, Mike says it's kind of embarrassing sometimes. <laughs> but uh, he's doing good. And uh, he's, he's fighting this leukemia. Well, let us join together in prayer. First, in a moment of silence as we settle our hearts and focus on God. First scripture reading this morning comes from James in chapter 2. James wrote, My brothers and sisters, do you 
with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while well, to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convinced, convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but falls in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. <clears throat> now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment without mercy will Judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, Keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Thus far, God's word. Faith 
without works is dead. There's a t-shirt, I think it's uh, offered on the uh, United Church of Christ uh, website. It says it well. In different lines it says, love thy neighbor, thy homeless neighbor, thy Muslim neighbor, thy black neighbor, thy gay neighbor, thy immigrant neighbor, thy Jewish neighbor, thy Christian neighbor, thy atheist neighbor, thy disabled neighbor, thy addicted neighbor. We could easily add to that list. When I was serving a congregation in Worcester, Massachusetts, we had an occasional visitor named Shirley. Shirley had been a vibrant young woman, very accomplished. But then she had been involved in a tragic accident that caused some brain damage. We would see Shirley in worship for a few Sundays, and, and then she'd be gone for a while. Uh, when I would see her on the street during those times, she would say, Oh, Pastor Day, I found out that I'm really Roman Catholic. <laughs> You see, we shared Shirley with the other churches in Quinn Sigmund Village. And with one exception, the churches in the village all treated her well, even though she could be disruptive. She would often stand up in the service and tell people that she was the mother of God and would try to bring a special message to us from God. It was a good test of the grace and graciousness of our congregation. That inner city church often had other visitors as well. Sometimes a homeless person, dirty, even smelly, would come wandering into the sanctuary. Or, quite often, would have Recent immigrants that would find their way into the church, Vietnamese, Hispanic, Mediterranean. You see, Quinn Sigamon Village, where the church was set, had at one time been a Swedish ghetto. All the churches in the neighborhood had Swedish backgrounds. I served Bethlehem Covenant Church, which had begun its life as the second Swedish Congregationalist. Uh, the story is told that the, the Swedes had a little bit of trouble with that word congregational. And there's a Swedish word that sounds like it, kongrelista, which means troublemaker. <laughs> but there was also a Swedish Lutheran church, a Swedish Methodist church, a Salvation Army Scandinavian Corps. It's the only place where I saw, you know, the symbol of the Salvation Army with the, with the S entwined around the cross was Salvation. Well, this one had an F for the Swedish word Frelsings Army, Salvation Army. And they had the, the flags of the, the Scandinavian countries up in the front. And a Swedish Baptist church. Even, even the Roman Catholic church in the village was called St. Catherine of Sweden. At one time it had been a Swedish ghetto, but no longer. When I was there in the 80s and 90s, it was about 40% uh, multi-ethnic and a lot transitional. Our Sunday school looked like a mini United Nations, and it was wonderful. Unfortunately, we weren't able always to get the, the families, the parents involved in the church. We did spawn daughter church, a Vietnamese congregation that uh, is still thriving today. Well, it was crossing those kind of barriers, economic, cultural, even language barriers, that was a challenge to the church and is still a challenge to many churches around the world. Well, 
Today's gospel reading puts the challenge even more boldly. From Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syro-Phoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your God. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. This passage is, I dare say, one of the most puzzling and troubling incidents in Jesus' ministry. His interaction with this Gentile woman seems so out of character. Did Jesus really just call her a dog? Well, the problem is we only have the words of the narrative and the dialogue, and not even all of that. We don't have Jesus' tone. We don't have his body language. Luke, who also was writing a second-hand account, was probably so troubled by this incident that he left it out entirely. And parallel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they're going along pretty much telling the same story, but, but this particular incident, Luke passes over. Matthew's account of the incident tells us that it was his disciples who urged Jesus first to send the woman away. And their pleas prompted Jesus to put their thoughts into words. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24. The people of Israel, you see, were considered the children of God. And all Gentiles were often looked down on as dogs. But by the tone of his voice and perhaps his body language, maybe Jesus was saying these things with a smile, a wink, he invited the Gentile woman into this kind of playful dialogue. Let the children be fed first. For it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Sir, even the dogs eat the children's crumbs. Call me a dog, will you? Well, give a dog its due. In February, Diana and I adopted a four-year-old miniature Australian shepherd, Daisy. Daisy is a terrible beggar, <laughs> sitting under the table at every single meal, even though we have never fed her from the table. We learned that she had been surrendered by a family that had six children, so she probably had plenty of crumbs to clean under that table. In fact, she came to us with a a bladder stone condition, probably from getting too many things that she shouldn't have eaten. Two of our previous dogs, Gretchen and Tuffy, both cockerpoos, had picked up that bad habit as well when our children were young. In fact, I think our youngest daughter used to sneak her vegetables. <laughs> to Gretchen whenever she could. But our last dog, Lady, who 
passed away just a year ago. Never did get into that bad habit. You see, we got her as a puppy um, after we were empty nesters. And we never fed her from the table. If we had some scraps, we'd some, sometimes afterwards we'd put it in her dish. But during meals, she would simply lay in the other room and wait. And then after the meal, she'd go and check her dish to see if there were any goodies in it. <coughs> Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. This Gentile woman got it when Jesus' disciples, as often, so often, remained obtuse. And she responded to Jesus in kind. See, I believe Jesus was trying to teach his disciples and us the need to expand the circle of what it means to love our neighbors. Indeed, from the very beginning of this passage, we read that Jesus went to the region of Tyr. That's in modern day Lebanon. Then as now, it was outside the boundaries of Israel, Gentile territory. And what's more, when Jesus returned from Tyr, he traveled into another territory beyond Israel's boundaries. Picking up the narrative at verse 31. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the De De Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ear, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. While Tyr was a region to the north of Galilee, the Decapolis, literally ten cities in Greek, was a Gentile area to the east and southeast of Galilee, present-day Syria and Jordan. The man whom Jesus healed was undoubtedly a Gentile, although the narrative doesn't tell us that. Jesus had compassion on him when others were maybe putting him forward to be healed because they wanted to see a spe something spectacular. Jesus took him aside privately and healed him, literally fulfilling the vision of Isaiah, that the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the tongue of the speechless shall sing for joy. Isaiah 35, which called us to worship this morning, invites us to join in the song of praise to God. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Shammah. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come and save you. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. 
Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah invites us also to walk in the highway of holiness. James would say that this is to put our faith into action and so fulfill the royal law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, whoever that neighbor may be. Even though we fulfill that royal law imperfectly, James reminds us that we are to speak and to act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, and that Jesus' mercy triumphs over judgment. And so this morning we come to the table to be fed, nourished, forgiven, and restored by God's grace. The Gentile woman joined Jesus in a playful dialogue about family pets eating crumbs under the table. There's an old penitential hymn that takes a slightly different take on those who come to the Lord's table, reminding us that we have no claim on God's grace. Rather, we acknowledge our unworthiness and look to God's mercy. So let us, as we prepare for communion, join together in singing this hymn, Not Worthy Lord, to gather up.
Friends, this is the joyous, joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all who trust in him to share the feast he has prepared. Let us therefore reverently attend to the words of institution of this sacrament as they are delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul adds that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and look to his coming again. Let us pray. Gracious God, loving Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you did not withhold even your own Son but gave him up for us. That his, in his brokenness we might be made whole. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you were obedient to the will of the Father, even to shed your blood for us on the cross. That it might become to us a stream of living life. O Holy Spirit, you communicate to us the grace of the Father and the Son. We pray now that you would consecrate this bread and this cup from a common to a sacred use, but even more consecrate us who partake of this sacrament that we might truly be the body of Christ to those around us. That the blood of Christ, his love and grace may course through our veins and reach out to all of those around us. Amen. I invite you at this time to very carefully remove the, the clear seal at the top of the, the cup and unveil the, the bread. The bread that we break is that not a participation in the body of Christ. We though many are one, but we all partake of the one bread. Now I invite you to take very carefully the, the purple seal and slide that back to reveal the, the juice. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing together in the blood of Christ? Drink of it, all of you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
and you have fed our spirits with your word and this sacrament. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you and our neighbor with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Just a reminder that we are hoping to have a Holly Fair on November 20th, the Saturday before Thanksgiving. And we will have tables there for people other than the Women's Fellowship. If you would like to have a table, you need to speak to me by September 15th. We will give first option to congregational members. Where across the crowded ways of life, 
We'll sing the first verse and then verses four, five, and six. Thank you. 